Welcome to Pablo Held Investigates. In today's episode, I get to talk to the great Kurt Rosenwinkel. I first heard about his music through a guitar friend of mine. I was visiting him in the early 2000s in his apartment in Amsterdam, and he would often go to the conservatory to practice. And I didn't, so I stayed in his apartment and listened to his records. He was older than me, so he was already, you know, checking out all the cool guys that I didn't know about. You know, I was basically educated through the record collection of my parents. So I, I went through all his records, found this record called The Next Step, and he really encouraged me to listen to that one. And the first notes, you know, I still remember how I heard this uh, incredible intro of Kurt's, his epic hit, Shivago. I can still tap into that feeling and of how that felt. You know, I was, it was so otherworldly to me somehow, his, his, his lines and his sound, just uh, the very, very imaginative way of playing. And obviously he became a, a big influence on my playing, on my music. I've been following him since then. And I'm very, very happy that we got the chance to talk about many different things about his past, about coming up uh, in New York, playing at Smalls with his great quartet with Mark Turner, Jeff Ballard and Ben Street. The fresh sound years, you know, there were certain important albums for me like Vine by Chris Cheek. Stranger Things Have Happened by the great Seamus Blake, an album that I really listened to lots of times. I mean, for a long time, that was like my favorite record. The Next Tech by, by Kurt, different other records. We, we talk about them and how it felt for him to, to be in that music. And we also talk about his new album where he plays piano. I'm very thankful to Kurt for doing this with me and I'm happy I can share it with you now. If you like the podcast, please consider subscribing to this channel and leave a comment. I always read them and try to reply to them. And if you would like to support the podcast even more, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Pablo Held. It really helps me to continue this podcast and develop it further. And I'm also sharing exclusive content with my patrons. I'm doing online hangouts. I'm sharing lead sheets. And you also can get a discount on the investigation notes notebook that is available on my Bandcamp page. So if you want to uh, support me, please consider going to patreon.com slash Pablo Held. I wish you all the best and I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did doing it. Conversation with the great Kurt Rosenwinkel. I had a conversation with Ben Street and uh, we talked about the quartet you guys had together. And there was one specific uh, story that I really liked about uh, you guys hanging out in one of your apartments, dealing with voicings and finding out where, where, where to put the bass note and uh, where to maybe change the voicing to, to find a different sound. And I would like to, um, to get your perspective on your working relationship and especially this, uh, this kind of voicing lab situation. Yeah, we were, Ben and I were living together in Brooklyn and uh, Ben and Jeff and I, Jeff Ballard, uh, were, were playing a lot of trio back then. And then we realized that Mark Turner had moved down the street. So we gave him a call and he came over and then we started playing. And that was the the uh, the beginning of, of, of that band. Um, and... Um, and it was such a perfect, perfect experience uh, in terms of how a band can can uh, can form and grow together. Because we had a week uh, weekly gig at Smalls every Tuesday, and then yeah. the rest of the time, you know, we would just have like little gigs around town. And so we had a lot of time, and I was writing a lot of songs, and we would rehearse uh, the rest of the week a few times, and. Mm. So we had a lot of uh, really comfortable time to hang out and work on the tunes and just do things like Ben was talking about, like 
take a look at um you know little moments of 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 my songs and or what we're playing and and uh figure out what works best and so maybe like that might have been a moment where i learned that if i put the fifth in the root of my chord on the e string the lowest note would like if i'm playing a c chord uh i'll put the g on my lowest note and that will couple with with ben playing yes. his low c you know and to understand how the guitar and the bass really uh um fit together in in a voicing you know and become one a solid uh structure a strong um sound together in in whatever particular voicing like a lot of we did a lot of that like learning how things fit together uh between the guitar and the bass you know so that was one aspect that was really cool about about that time mm. having so much time and I, I was writing all the all all day and and all night and uh and then we'd go and we'd play the tunes at smalls or maybe we had another gig here or there around the city and um so it was easy to to reflect upon the progression of of our of our group because we had the same situation every week you know the same yeah. club perfect. with the same yeah. sound yeah it was perfect yeah you, it doesn't i remember one time i was i was standing outside the club we had played the first set there was lines around the block for the second set and uh meldow was there and he just turned to me he said you know it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> ah. And uh and he was right. <laughs> well, did you record a lot of the the um the gigs or even the rehearsals and listen to yeah. it together with the band even? Uh we didn't really listen together as a band to the recordings, but there are a lot of recordings. I made a lot of dat Uh, recordings mm -hmm. you know dat tape recorders were there and those things were so cool because you know you could record digitally and it had xlr inputs for the mic so you could put up stereo mics that were really good record the whole thing digitally and so i have like a briefcase filled with dat tapes from from that era great and uh sometimes i <clears throat> put them in and skip around see if there's anything that might release but uh there there is actually there's a there's a live at small sort of like master tape that maybe <laughs> oh that's cool release that's good sometime yeah, yeah. It, i mean it's very uh for for some people it's hard to listen to themselves um and yeah. some people really like doing it to to really get into the thick you know to to the as you mm. said the gray areas yeah. are very apparent when we listen to it and so it sometimes it hurts sometimes but i found yeah. also i i listen to my own recordings a lot to to really uh, because it feels so different sometimes in the moment when you play like when you listen back absolutely you get a more realistic sense of how it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> can be quite brutal right yeah yeah but then those are the moments where you can then maybe which you could then address in a rehearsal situation which i'm sure you did mm -hmm. then afterwards after listening to it or would you vocalize the things that you were would like to work on more or well i think f for me listening to it was more of a uh subject of my own playing you mm -hmm. know because because uh that was the part of the the puzzle that i felt needed the most work on i thought us as a band everything felt so great and uh, you know those guys play so amazing so when i listen to it i just sort of focus on my own 
choices and my own reactions and my own impulses and and uh, my own subjective experience and how that uh, translates to the to the music I'm playing and mm. and to get a perspective on on that like oh I see that I I remember that I had an impulse. Um, as a reaction to what somebody did in this one moment and it had this effect on the music and maybe that's not the effect that I that I wanted to have mm -hmm. and so you know taking a close look at 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 my own responses and trying to grow as a musician as an improviser by being more aware of um of how I'm responding and how that affects the music. You yeah. Know? I wasn't there, obviously, uh, when you guys played at Smalls during that time. Um, but I, I know the record and a few bootlegs. And uh, I'm I'm curious about, because there's this one track on, on Next Step where you also play piano, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was wondering how, how much uh, playing the, of playing the piano was part of the live thing at Smalls for you too. Yeah, it was kind of. I would always play uh, usually the last song of of each set you know, on piano, and um, I think we were playing definitely the next step, and maybe sometimes we played Mister Hope, mm -hmm. a song of mine written for Elmo Hope, and uh, yeah, it was kind of like that. It was like uh, um, one tuna set kind of deal. Um. Yeah, I. I don't know exactly why <laughs> we did that. It was just fun, and you know, a lot. A lot of my music resides on the piano, so like I wanted to play that tune, and I don't play that tune on on the guitar like the song "The Next Step." That's very much a piano song. So yeah, I wrote it on the piano. I can play it on piano, mm. so it just seemed like that was a uh, an important song for for the band at that moment, and so we would play it. Obviously, it became the title track of the album. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think you know, like I used to tour with Mark Turner in his band and playing his music, and I also would play like one tune or two tunes nice. a night on on the piano with him yeah there's just cool. some different things that you can do on piano that you can't do on guitar that absolutely sometimes... and vice versa yeah yeah do you think of the piano sometimes when you play the guitar i tried to put a distortion pedal on the piano it didn't sound so good <laughs> <laughs> well you didn't do it on the new record that's for sure <laughs> yeah no i didn't do it on the new record pianos got it all by itself <laughs> yeah but do you sometimes sometimes think of the the piano when you when you i mean or should i say uh of different instruments when you play the the guitar do you think of different instruments yes. to get a, a different inspiration out of the instrument yes yes for sure um <clears throat> I think uh many guitarists are 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 the same in that regard. Um I'm definitely thinking about horn players whether it's Coltrane or uh or Johan or or Sonny Rollins. Hmm. And uh or uh, the that those guys on tenor and then you know thinking of Charlie Parker you know, on, on, uh, alto, you know, and so I'm thinking a lot of the lines I hear in my head are coming from the language and the way of playing, uh, from, from those musicians, you know, and, and then also I'm thinking about quarterly, like Bill Evans or, uh, Herbie, yeah or or um keith sometimes you know duke mm -hmm. you know uh sometimes i'm trying to emulate you know what 
what they do or just try to play my own songs as well and to take from what I know on the piano as a pianist myself mm. and and put that on the guitar. So there's a lot of cross-pollination between uh, the guitar and the piano uh, for me as, as a pianist and as a guitarist. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, but usually it's... <laughs> Actually, honestly, it's it's more going one way. It's more like I try to take the stuff on piano and put it on the guitar um, because usually I'm writing a song that then I have to play on guitar, mm -hmm. you know, so I have to learn it. You know, I'm not like there's not a lot of like demands placed on me as a pianist. <laughs> so I now have to learn a, a bunch of songs. I don't write a song on guitar and then have to play it on piano, so it yeah. doesn't go the other way very often. Yeah, yeah, but um, uh, yeah. I mean, on on the guitar, there's there's like all of those different instruments that I'm thinking about and emulating and hearing in my head the kind of language that that comes from those instruments, and then trying to figure out a way to to ex express it to to get that out on the guitars like for me like uh the whole thing that that i the sound that i have that's coming from the sound of a tenor saxophone you know like where there's not a lot of attack on each note where yes. you can create you can create a line that has syncopation that every note doesn't have to be delineated with mm -hmm. a with a transient you know and it's just you have five notes and then you have a note that comes out and another note and another note yeah and you have this syncopated line and um i mean there's many ways to do that on the guitar first and foremost it's about you know your right hand picking and your left right left hand coordination and you know i've i've done a lot of that and played a lot that way but more and more i started to get into the mechanics and the the science around how the string is reacting to the pick and mm -hmm. how the how the pickup is is responding to that cuz it's not just acoustic it's not just an acoustic guitar with a string and a pick and a sound hole it's it's also the the magnetic mm -hmm pickup you know which which affects the string you know it if it's too close to the string it'll stop the vibration of the string for example you know so right. the magnetic field of the pickup is interacting with with the mechanics and the feel of the instrument and then of course you don't you don't hear it at the instrument when you're playing electric guitar you hear it at the speaker so the the whole system um, is completed when you hear what's coming out of the speaker. So everything that that's going along the way has a, an effect on how you hear it and then how you play. You mm. know, so so that's the the completion of that of that sound and that instrument. You know, it's all those things. I'm very curious about how you think about the evolution of your sound yeah it's definitely it's always evolving that's for sure um i think i think essentially i've had one sound in my head my whole life in a way and i'm i've always been trying to get closer to it and so every iteration along the way is like a uh some kind of point in time on this journey to try to find that magical combination of sound and touch and feel you know that's that's going to express the the aspects of music that i that i that i hear in my head and that i feel you know the the aesthetic qualities of of the sound how it interacts with the other instruments mm. how that cr creates a magical world on the stage 
you know, for the audience, for the listener, and for the musicians and for the song, you know. And so I look at uh, every every step away along the way as as a in a continuum um, progression towards you know this this the same uh, sort of. Uh, imagination that I have this ideal in my head yeah. and 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 I'm always adding to it and you know being inspired by more things along the way um but yeah with the voice basically it was in the in 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 my early 20s when I started to um be when I started to be asked to do some some recording sessions and to do some albums with people I'd get into the studio and sometimes it would be the, the greatest studios in the world you know and power station in in New York City uh which is now what's it called um was it bought by Berkeley and it's yeah, yeah yeah it was just it was just bought by Berkeley and um And that studio is incredible, and I did a lot of recording sessions there. But I would go in and I'd play with you know all these heavy cats, and then and then I would be very despondent afterwards because I would listen back, and my I would feel like they didn't get my like they didn't get my sound. And everybody was always saying like Ben used to say it all the time like Kurt, they didn't get your sound, they didn't get your sound. Mm. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know why, I'd, and it was a real mystery to me and the people around me too. And nobody really realized like uh, why they, why I couldn't get a good sound in the studio, and that was like a huge um, dilemma of mine mm -hmm. because I was getting these like really high profile recording sessions, and then feeling like uh, I couldn't play because the sound wasn't right and I didn't know why until I started to realize that I was singing when I was playing and when I play live like at Smalls um, there's the sound of the guitar that's coming out of the amplifier but then there's like the sound that I'm sort of intercepting it with with my voice And the and the combination of those two sounds, that's my sound. Mm. It's not what's coming out of the amplifier. So if you put a mic up to the amplifier, you're you're not gonna get my sound, you know, because my sound is out here, and it's the commingling of what happens when I when I temper the when I alter the sound of the guitar with the sound of my voice. It's like yeah. a an interception and changing the sound in order to get it to and that becomes the sound that that goes out that people hear Absolutely. as my sound and i didn't i didn't i wasn't even aware that that was happening you know for a long time for years <laughs> and then it was only it was only when we were going to go in to record the next step that i realized that that was a important thing to capture and that was the first time that i asked um uh james farber the engineer to to put a, a vocal mic uh, and record my singing yeah uh at, at the same time and then then when i when i realized that that element is 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 a part of the guitar sound that's when i started to use a mic live as well and to put it through the guitar amp you know to blend it with the guitar oh, before yeah. mm. before it comes out the speaker so then after that it's you know lots of experimentation with different you know ways to blend the the voice you know with the guitar <laughs> If you would show your sound to, uh, I don't know, the Kurt in the 20s, you know, uh, what what do you think uh, would he say? <laughs> He'd say, holy shit, that's it. <laughs> 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 How'd you do that? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I've been thinking about. You know, that's what I've been 
dreaming about. Mm -hmm. That's the sound. But the funny yeah. thing for us as listeners is like all the way up to the next step, all the records you made before that, we now have the sound from now and from the next step in our remembrances. And as some, I, I feel like when I'm listening to The Call or, um, you know, some some record where you down, don't sound like that already, you know, I fill in the gaps with with my mind somehow without mm. thinking about it you know i love how you play on call and uh, how you how you sound there you know um, although it's very early you know i remember that session and uh i remember what i was using this this particular pedal on that session similar trying to achieve this the similar thing that i do now it, i was using a boss delay and i put the delay on the on the fastest delay setting mm. which was like just you know a couple milliseconds after i would play a note then it would put put a delay and then i'd turn the the mix all the way wet mm. so that you you were only hearing what the delay pedal was generating as a delay Yes. To, to the to the sound. So it gets this weird kind of uh, attack. This kind of like this de-emphasized transient. Mm -hmm. You know, I was even doing that, trying to find a solution for that. Then I remember. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. That's the sound I had on that on that album. What do you? What else do you remember about that session? I remember rehearsing at Kevin Hayes' house on Carroll Street um, with uh, with everybody and feeling how cool the groove was with Larry and, and uh, Bill Stewart, yeah. And that was the first time I played with Bill Stewart and it felt so great and that was a really great group and it was it was really cool to play with Seamus again because Seamus and I had been very close friends for many years and we used to live together in Boston mm. for for a couple I think two or three years in Boston we lived together so we were roommates very close and I love his playing and I love playing his tunes and so I was I was so psyched about being on that album playing with those great cats man it was it was very cool sound very fresh yeah sounding group you know so I, i really enjoyed that a lot another important album for me from your sideman work is uh, vine by chris cheek mm, yeah that's and a great album that has a specific vibe and it has a um, yeah you seem like I don't think I've heard you like this on any other record. I don't know what, what happened there. Um, it has a specific energy you're playing on, on that, um, uh, on that record. And I'm, I'm curious uh, if you have any remembrances of what of kind of, that what kind of energy? <laughs> I mean, it's very, um, it's very energetic and it's very out there. It's very present. Um, uh, It's all attributes that you could say to any of your other appearances, but somehow I resonate to with with that in a, in a, in another way. I don't know. It's hard to for me to put into words. Yeah, how you sound over those pieces is just incredible, and um, I'm curious. Well, I think there's there's something about Chris's songs that are there's so much to to dig into you know they're so beautiful and such a vibe they have they have such a depth and a soulfulness that i really find energizing i guess and really uh you know want to just dive into and there's so much to express of yourself in his songs that i i remember feeling the The profundity of of the song itself, and and wanting to feel it as as 
deeply as I could through the playing, you know? Yeah. And so maybe that's where that energy is coming from that, that you're responding to. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris is such a unique and incredible musician. You know, he's, he's, he's got the, he's got the Midas touch, you know, it's like every, (laughs) every solo is golden, man. And everything he plays, every melody is just like perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so incredible. What an incredible improviser. Um, Awesome guy. One of the funniest people I've ever met. He's just hilarious. And um, what a sweet guy. You know, we were real close in Berkeley. We used to do our laundry together. (laughs) We used to take our laundry down to the laundromat and sit there for a few hours, like, just shooting the shit. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) <laughs> and then do a session but yeah chris is one of the greatest musicians i know and you know i think anybody who knows him feels the same way mm. yeah what is your process in terms of uh, approaching a sideman situation like that how do you prepare for for being a sideman for somebody else i first of all just try to uh there's a lot of just empathy that that's that's uh that's at play when i'm a side man because you know my i see my goal is to uh bring everything i can to 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 be in the service of this music this other music this person's vision you know and so i try to get as close to understanding uh, and feeling what their vision is you know so that i can uh greater uh play that that music and and make that music be itself as much as possible you know and so that's a a high degree of sort of meditating on a on a on a um sort of uh metaphysical level on a karmic level as uh as an artist to put myself into their world and try to feel this the things that that they're expressing with their music and to try to uh understand the ins and outs of of the dimensions of of their craft and and their imagination and, and what they're trying to say, I'll spend a lot of time just really studying their music. Maybe I'll write out my own charts mm-hmm. for their songs. I'll write out my own voicings. I'll make different, come at it different, some different ways, so that I can really <clears throat> uh, inhabit the space of of their tunes. Um, Mm. so there's, there's a lot of preparation and there's, you know, I, I mean, obviously every situation is not ideal, but ideally I, I try to have, um, several day, at least several days of like really slow time, take my time, take one song and just take the time to allow it to take root in an unstressed uh, or hurried way so that so that it just really becomes natural when I'm playing it you know obviously if somebody throws me a couple charts and says we're gonna play these in 10 minutes then you d- you do you know you 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 got your skills and you do what you can do um and then it's a faster thing but uh yeah that's that's basically my process mm. however long i have to do it is is a different uh is always a variable but that's my process mm. can you break it down a little bit more specific in terms of okay what's happening if you have a challenging song maybe you can even demonstrate or talk about a specific um uh, song 
um, how you break down a song and try to to get to the core of it so you can be fluent and and uh, and free over it. Well, yeah, I mean it's like uh, it's like any anything that you learn, you know. I'll take the the axe and take the the chart and just start to read it and start to just get it from the page onto the into the fingers onto the fretboard one way you know uh there's there's many different ways that you can play a melody on the guitar so you know i'll i'll try to find the mem the 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 way that the that the that the melody sounds the best you know because finger mechanics can alter the the sound and and articulation of a melody on the guitar so it can sound like you can have different emphases if you play it this way or that way so i'll try to find the right way um physically that the melody has the kind of contour that i that i want it to have or that i think it should have you know so i'll experiment with different places to play the the melody on the guitar mm -hmm. and through that experimentation i'm also learning how that song is unfolding and on, on different parts of the neck you know so so then ultimately you know i'll be able to play the melody in any area of the guitar which is important because i don't want to be limited to one place yeah or one way or one way to play the song um I, I don't like that feeling of of being like stuck here Absolutely. or else like or else there's like you know alligators uh <laughs> over lava over here <laughs> yeah lava <laughs> you know um so <laughs> yeah alligators in lava yeah <laughs> lava most, gators yeah very scary <laughs> yeah so I'll I'll just learn it in lots of different places in the neck and you know put the chords in find the right voicings for the you know and then take a look at how each each cadence flows you know cuz a lot of the a lot of modern songs are non diatonic non functional so it takes uh it takes some some study to to get a grasp of how one chord goes to another and how that goes to the to the next yeah. and what the lines are that are that are threading through those changes and how melodies work and just to get it in your ear so that you can feel like you're flowing through the stream of, of the harmony you know absolutely and and understanding you know how things go like if you're if you if you you know if you if you ski up to that ledge you'll have to do a, a dive down at a, at a certain point you know and to know when that is so that you can do it gracefully you know mm -hmm. and uh so there's a lot of that just kind of like and i'll take the progression maybe i'll record some guitar into the iphone and just playing the chords and then i'll play along to it um, mm -hmm. and just just shed the tune and sometimes if i have the time and i'm home i'll make like a little demo for myself mm. playing playing drums and keyboard and bass and uh you know to to play uh with the with the rhythmic context you know of the tune and uh play along to that so that's that's more or less like what I what I do. How was it to uh to play with uh, Paul Motion in in the Electric Bebop band interacting with all these other guitarists? Yeah. <laughs> it was a trip. It was wild. I love Brad Shepik and we had such a good time together uh negotiating our different styles so that we can you know make music together and it, he's such a great dude and a great player we're very different so there was a lot to 
to learn from about our about playing together mm. and i think that that was really valuable i know that it was really valuable for me about uh just about like accommodating space for for somebody else especially when they don't you know like like me and mark for example we're like of the same mind like mark turner and i when we play together it's like we're we're both meditating on the same thing you know so it's like this kind of group hive mind kind of feeling like mm -hmm. that we're that we're adding to each other's uh meditation and becoming something that's 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 unified between us but like with uh with uh, other players you know there's there's this kind of like okay well there's a different energy there and it's not my energy so how do you uh coexist with that and and make room for that other person's sound and have respect for their their conception of, of how to play you know so i think that that's a very valuable uh thing to to learn you know is how to accommodate other people's uh approach you know mm. and so that you're you're not getting in the way but you're still able to coexist and then play and make something interesting and dynamic and cool happen you know and i think that's what happened with with brad and i you know very different approaches very different sounds and and conceptions but we were able to to really find a way that what we did together when we were playing together was some made something that was that was cool so i really appreciated that and um also got the chance to play with Wolfgang Muspiel mm -hmm. uh, a bit, and I really admire his playing. Always have, you know. He was he was the uh, the reigning king at Berkeley when when I got there, you know. So when I got there, it was like Wolfgang was like the greatest, you know. And so I always have that kind of you know perspective about Wolfgang um, just from that experience when I met him and uh, mm -hmm. when I was coming up. And so it was great to to play with him in in Paul's band, and also playing with Chris Potter and Chris Cheek in the band was amazing. And Josh Redman was playing in the band uh, for one tour, the first tour, and uh, they're amazing, incredible to play with those cats. And uh, Steve Swallow and Paul mm -hmm. holding it down, just swinging their asses off, and spending 10 years of my life with Paul Motion's ride cymbal like right at my left ear was the best kind of ear damage you could ever <laughs> hope to have. <laughs> yeah. Know? So yeah. So I'm grateful for that. I really feel like I uh kind of internalized his sense of swing which is uh has deep deep roots you know back to Cl kenny clark and mm. you know so and paul you know i just tried to smoke soak up as much uh of 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 paul's depth and and approach that i that i could you know did you so, ask him a lot of questions uh not really um I asked him some. I mean, we had a lot of time together, so there was a lot of conversations. Most of the time, most of the time, there was there wasn't really a need for me to ask questions because there was like a running conversation going, and you know, a lot of just listening. Paul and uh, and Steve would just be talking about times and people and things that happened over the in the past you know so they were always reminiscing and it was mm. always fascinating to to hear them talking about the old days and the old cats and everything like that do you remember um, any specific stories no i don't i don't remember anything <laughs> <laughs> how about like specific uh, pieces of advice uh, by uh, paul did he give you any advice mm. no no, he he wasn't that kind of guy. He 
was just like kind of just be yourself and and I mean that was what you got from just being around him you know it wasn't like he he was like very he wasn't very like fatherly mm. giving advice like Gary Burton was more like that he was like mm-hmm. this is this is how you do it this is you know you should develop that always giving you pointers and stuff with Gary Burton mm-hmm. which was great and uh talking a lot about your own development and how you what's important and uh you know and and paul was more just like let, let's have fun and play and you know he wouldn't get more specific than like okay you play the first chorus and then you play the second chorus <laughs> yeah. or you and then you trade you know and then you play you play eight and then you play eight and then you play four and you play four and then you know that was pretty much um it other than you know this is the tune play the head play a couple choruses trade take it out you know yeah <laughs> cuz it was the bebop band so yeah, yeah, yeah we were playing we were playing straight up bebop tunes how about the repertoire like when when paul would bring in a new tune would he expect you guys to know it or uh would he bring a sheet or how was that process of putting together a repertoire there was always sheets coming in always always sheet music for whatever we were going to play um somebody you know he would say what about that tune reincarnation of a love bird you know charles mingus you know and uh yeah, yeah that's great let's find a sheet on that and so he would he would call maybe uh al sickler don sickler yeah and uh don sickler would send him a chart you know and then we'd mm. have a chart of it you know or or Chris Potter would say, I've got a chart on that. And then, I so see. That, you know, um, you know, maybe uh, I think we were playing this great tune of Charles Mingus called East Coasting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, I think Brad Shepik wrote a chart for that and, and brought it in. Uh, I brought in, I wrote a chart out of, uh, Elmo Hope's Eyes So Beautiful As Yours. Ah, oh, that's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, what a great song. One, of, one of my favorite songs. And mm-hmm. so I brought that tune in and we were playing that one. So different people would bring in different charts and or somebody would suggest a tune and he'd ask somebody for the chart. Yeah. So I've got a big book of of the repertoire from that great. band. Tons of songs, yeah. That's great. Tell me about Lost Song really quickly. Well, Lost Song was an interesting story because I wrote it, I played it once with the band with Mark, Ben, and Jeff in in the year 2000. Wow. And 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 then never played it again and I lost the chart and I lost the recording. Wow. And so I knew that there was the song that was lost. I knew we played it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find any sheet on it. I couldn't find any recording of it. Could you remember and it all? I could remember the feeling of it. <laughs> and I remembered that it went from E minor to G minor, but I didn't remember anything else about it, you know? And I tried to find it for uh, every once in a while, I'd try to find it like over the course of the next 20, 20 years, you know, and uh, never was able to find it. I was looking, really looking, you know, because I, I knew that there it was a good song. I remember it being a good song, and I you know, try to find it, go through my computers, wow. go through all my papers looking for it. Never had success. And at at one time, there was a guy who came to one of my shows and he was amazing. He kept giving me uh, compilation CDs of, uh, you know, live recordings of Bird and, and, uh, and, and Sonny and Coltrane, rare stuff, you know, mm. and with, with the pieces of paper 
that would say what everything was on the on these CDs and he gave me a bunch of them and I had this big stack of of these CDs and papers from this guy and I hadn't gone through everything that he had given me and I had I just kind of like had it around for for years and every once in a while I would like take a CD out and check it out and so but there was this kind of big pile and then I was going through it recently and on one of the CDs he was like this is a performance that you made in at the Jazz Standard in in the year 2000 on this one day and here's the list of songs and one of them was unknown song and I played it and that there it was that was the only time that song had ever been Wow. played live and this man had captured it given it to me like 18 years later and and that was the and i found it again that was there it was, <laughs> it was that's like, so cool wow. i cannot believe it and uh so that was a great moment oh my god wow. it was 20 20 years of longing yeah. after this song you know it's, it's a great so, song man wow Thanks. I think that's that song and uh, Cycle Five are my favorite songs from the recording. Oh, and cool. we can get into different spef specifics about the album, of course. But I just wanted to say that what struck me most about the album is, you know, apart from the beautiful music and everything and your great playing, is that your um, your musical vision and your sound comes through regardless of instruments. You know, uh, I found that really cool, you know, to, to see that, like, I had to think of that intro, those arpeggios on music. I've heard you play something like that on the guitar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. What I'm getting is your, your musical vision, pure. Cool. And, yeah, that's really cool. That's so cool. What are your thoughts on that, like on transcending instruments? Like that recording made it clear for me that um, the instruments are instruments, instruments that we that we use to get something across, you know. And once you mm. see an artist um, uh, use different instruments, as you have been doing before, but you get more a sense of what that person actually wants to to get across, mm. you know. And yeah. then it becomes less about instruments. Yeah, just wait until my uh, my kazoo album. <laughs> That's gonna be. It's just gonna sound the same. Yeah, it's gonna be the same shit. <laughs> I want to hear those arpeggios from music yeah. on the kazoo. Uh huh. Um. Yeah. Right. Uh. You know. Piano has always been there my whole life it's my first musical love mm. and uh you know when i started playing the piano i i thought i had to make up songs because there wasn't i didn't know anything i didn't know how to play anything so i just made up songs from the beginning that's how i started writing music um yeah The transcending of the instrument, yeah, there's, there's, it's, yeah, it's, it's this, uh, it's like a very fine membrane between you and music itself, you know, this instrument, it's just this membrane through which your feelings gain manifestation you know into music you know you're like broadcasting or like putting out these feelings messages and that's getting organized by the instrument and communing with music itself and so when you change the the membrane you change the instrument 
you have the same impulses that are organizing themselves and being manifested through the particulars of that instrument but are still connecting with music the same way you know that's why you know to me it makes sense to call it an instrument because it's something that is it's it's between you and music it's something that you're going through i think a lot of people stop at the instrument mm. in terms in terms of their intention you know like that's where the music is on the instrument mm -hmm. as opposed to the music is going through the instrument to the to make contact with with music itself yeah that's what that, that what's um, that's what's uh, coming across when i hear you play the piano i hear Thanks. you i don't hear the instrument i hear the instrument being played but you know um can we talk about cycle cycle five a little bit uh-huh Sure. <laughs> What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to know the process of how you how you uh, how you wrote it. You know, especially the that that uh, coda is something that's uh, really special. You know, um, what, what's what's the story behind it? How did you write it? I was at my dad's house. A lot of things that I've written have been um, written at my dad's house. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the album is dedicated to him. He passed away this past uh, March. No, and, I'm sorry. And uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I was at, at his house where I grew up and just messing around on the piano. And I just had this voicing F, the first voicing of the song, F over C. That's like a C, G, C, F, A. Let's go F in the right hand over C, five. It's kind of sus chord. And I was just messing around, transposing that through the cycle of fifths. Mm. And, you know, like... You could just go completely symmetrical up and down octaves, but I I wanted to collapse it all into as small a space as I could, so that the first chord was C G C F A, the second chord was B flat over. Uh, uh, something else. <laughs> uh, Where's the piano? Where's yeah, you can piano? dictate. I can try to play it if you like. Yeah, the second chord. <clears throat> well, yeah, was B flat. B flat over F. B flat over F. Yeah, yeah, exactly. F C F B flat D. Yeah. Right. That's the second one. Now, the third one is E flat over B flat, right? And instead of going up and using that same voicing you know, up there, uh, I just stayed in that area, and then the next voicing is F, B flat, G, B flat, E flat. F, B flat. F, B flat, E flat. Uh, F, B flat, G, B flat, E flat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, so the fifth is is the fourth. So you got the five on the bottom and the one there. Yeah. Anyway, I was just you know experimenting with collapsing this particular voicing through the cycle of fifths as an exercise for myself to learn the piano, and uh, and then a rhythm came out of that of dun 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 
Dun, 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 and then a melody came out of that. And I thought it was very peculiar how the same melody was was emanating from this progression just a half step down, you know, as you went through the keys. And that was just very, uh, I found that to be very charming, you know. And um, and fascinating. So I just kept playing it over and over and over, and then it started to develop, and then a little bass line came in there, you know, and and then I was experimenting with improvising over that progression, and I started to realize that when you're dealing with the cycle of fifths, um, and you can play one thing in the first key, another thing in the next key, and and another thing in the third key, and it'll all sound uh, together. Mm. So if you take, if you take, uh, you know, C, F, B flat as one sound, and so you know you've got twelve keys in the cycle of fifths. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve arranged in the cycle. Um, and I realized that that was true. Like you could play things in three keys, but if you added the fourth key, the fourth would conflict with the with the first. It would clash. You know, you'd get sounds that would clash together. So, but if you go one, two, three sounding together, and then you add the fourth while taking the first one away, mm. then you have another three tonalities that are sounding together that the second the third and the fourth and then third fourth fifth and if you progress that way through the keys three at a time but always adding one and taking one away going through it like a like a caterpillar or a snake you mm -hmm. know moves you know are you talking um, melodically or harmonically now in terms of uh, harmonically yeah harmonically and and the so the bridge chords came out of that realization that there are three triads together yeah and the the first one's like b flat major triad a flat major triad and and the e flat major triad all together and then the second chord is i think c f and b flat together all together you know um and then that last part that you were talking about so the whole song is just these different little investigations into the nature of the cycle of fifths, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, so the last part is uh, is just not even triads, but major thirds. So you start with G and B, and then you have F sharp and D, and then you have uh, E and oh no no wait. Uh, yeah, C sharp and A, you know, then you have E, B, and so on and so forth. And those go are going through also just uh, the circle of fifths. So you have G, D, A, E, uh, B, or whatever, and so forth. Um, and then... As I was practicing that, I realized also this this phenomena of three, three of them sounding together. So, da -de -da. Mm. so those notes, you know, G B F sharp D and uh, uh, A and C sharp, they all mm. sound together, and then moving forward like that, one two three two three four three four five four five six and then do them all together and then that becomes this like uh this spectral wandering you know this this spectral snake or something and i would just get lost in in that for for a long time for for minutes mm. and, <laughs> and uh, Literally minutes, I'd be lost in that, and <laughs> and then uh, so I found it to be very blissful, and 
that became the last part of that song. And then a melody kind of emerged out of that, that winds its way through that sea, almost like crowd surfing mm. the, those, those tonalities. It's like the melody just, just wandering over the top of it, you know, mm -hmm. as it's, as it's morphing by. So that's cycle five. That's why I called it cycle five because it's cycle of fifths. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Does it happen often with you that you create sort of um, compositional games uh, like that? You know, because it, it has a, a playful when you describe it. And I can, I can connect to that because I, I have similar things sometimes running through my mind, like, uh, like, like a child would put together things in, in you know, <laughs> With yeah. toys, you know. Yeah. Uh, do you do that often like that? Uh, yeah, I do. I I always got some little toy hanging around like that, you know, some musical toy to play with. Uh, I I really enjoy investigating the yeah the building blocks of music, you know, yeah. and and putting arranging them in different ways and seeing what you can come up with just using basic really basic concepts like cycle of five or just chromatic scale mm -hmm. um you know so uh yeah we could go to the piano should we go to the piano no oh that would be nice no. yeah um i don't think you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing but I'll be I'll tell you what I'm doing and I promise um, it's, it's live <laughs> Kurt, now the camera is ah there, there it's, it's back now perfect yeah can and you I can hear, hear it too I can hear it yeah okay cool yeah so um That's three of them. Then I picked I I picked up the first one and added the next one. So mm. okay, yeah. So I'm talking about cycle five, right, Pablo? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that ending part where you go one, two, three, mm. and then you add four and you lift up one. Yeah. Which time signature do you feel this? Oh, I feel it. I, that that was interesting. I had to like figure out how to write that down, and it ended up that I fell in like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bunch of uh, odd metered um, <clears throat> time signatures that that describe the melody that emerged like. Sorry. Oh, I'm messing it up though. Anyway, mm. um, yeah, I had to figure that out. It's a bunch of time signatures that elucidated that. So another, I wanted to show you this other kind of like uh, game, like you were talking about. Yeah. Using the building using the building blocks, right? So, so you have just like this pedal point, right? Let's see if you can tell what I'm doing here.
Any ideas? Wow, that sounds incredible. <laughs> it sounds cool, right? <laughs> it sounds very cool. So, at, 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 at one moment, it sounded to me like descending uh, triads, but with different inversions. But now I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah, that's that. You're you're right on it. It's 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 descending major scales. So just considering. Yeah. But oh. you just kind of you you kind of like the idea is to go through several of them uh, at the same at one go. So I'll go like A A flat G <laughs> G flat F E E flat D D flat C B B flat. You know. Like, Can you show how you um, how you combine them? Like A A flat G. Yeah. How would you do it? Right. So that might be like. So that's A, that's A flat. Yeah. That's G. Yeah. So you don't even hear the, since it's just little fragments of each of them, you don't hear them being a scale. You just yes. hear something, you know? <laughs> Is kind of resolving back to A, so Thank you, That's Kurt. a fun one. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> that reminds me of one uh, a sonata by Chopin. There's a little moment that I uh, took apart. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show it to you. It's very similar. Check it out. Oh, yeah. You yeah. get that? So <laughs> it's C yeah, major. Absolutely. And then it's B major, but from the third. And then it's B flat major. And then A major. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. That's cool. It reminds me of a little thing I came up with. Uh, like. Ooh. That's just F. Sh F sharp, E, D, and C, right? Yeah. But also, like, I uh, came up with this thing of um, going up in whole steps, right, in triads, but doing inversions. So C, D, E, F sharp, uh, A flat, B flat, and then you're back at C, and it's like... Yeah. Yeah. And go on forever. It like reminds that. me of Pedro. Pedro told to me, uh, um, talked to me in in our interview. We talked about K Seven Dreams, one of his songs, and he told me that I think this concept was his inspiration for one of the parts of that song. Oh really? Yeah, he said like you told him that that concept, <laughs> and he wrote that song yeah. around it. That's cool. <laughs> He's always stealing shit from me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, cool. I'm gonna get some publishing for that one then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. He's always like he's always like putting putting my progressions in his song. I'm like Pedro. He's like, oh man, I, I'm sorry, dude. I couldn't help it, man. It was, <laughs> it was just so nice. I wanted to use it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love Pedro. I can never yeah. get mad at Pedro. 
<laughs> beautiful cat. Yeah. That's actually a topic, and I hope I can frame it the right way. Um, that's actually a topic that I'm interested in. Like, you've been so influential throughout your career that people... <laughs> It's hard to, to put it into words, but, you know, I think people needed to really some time to figure out that how they deal with the inspiration that they got from you. Like there was a time when, ev and it's still like that way, uh, everybody wanted to try to play like you. And I wonder what this uh, does to you. You know, how, how was there a time when, when you uh, were realizing, shit, I'm Kurt and I have to be... <laughs> that curd for somebody else uh, as opposed to on, on top of being the curd for yourself, you know? Um, <laughs> hmm. it, it's, yeah. I, I guess it's a well, question in terms of yeah. with many levels, in terms of expectations towards yourself, but also from others towards you. Mm -hmm. And right. also, also not getting uh, <clears throat> off track by realizing you've, you've yourself have cultivated uh, a musical language of your own. What does it do to you when somebody else is trying to <laughs> say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to follow <laughs> your lead, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that the, the best thing that anyone can do is to try to become more themselves and to, to know themselves as fully as possible and i think if if you have to go through uh in being inspired is always a good thing when you're inspired by someone but um you know i think ultimately you you eat you have to realize that um you know your own music is is the best possible music that you could make because it's the truest it's it's the one that that's uh you know only you can be the best you so yeah um i'm always in a constant uh process of trying to know myself better so that i can understand the contours of what my music can be you know and um so I don't really worry or think about that other stuff very much at all. Um, I, I think when, when, uh, when somebody is, is sounding like me, uh, to me, if I hear it, it kind of sounds to me like they're, like i mean they can't be me and they're not being themselves so what actually are they doing um mm. they're, you know you're you're in the process of emulation which is which is cool i think ultimately everybody's going to learn going to realize that the most that that that's not a um the most powerful place to be uh playing from mm. i think you'll real you'll realize ultimately that it's from your own center that that's where you're going to find the the most uh power and and um uh yeah honesty and 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 best music you know i think if you get in touch with yourself so i think it's i see it at all as just part of the process that some people are might be going through mm -hmm. and for me i'm always trying to uh yeah just know myself better so i don't have any expectations on myself to be that guy whatever that is mm -hmm. uh, i'll i'll do anything and i mean you know people you could look at my career and stuff that i've done and and a lot of people have been surprised by the places i've gone but yeah and you know, people have said, "Oh, that's really brave of you." You know, to to make Kaipi, for example, that that was really brave of you to do that. But or to do hardcore, uh, or to do the next step. You know, they that's really brave of you as a as an artist. But <clears throat> for me, it's 
it's not really it's 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 just where the music is at that at that moment you know so i have i just be true to that you know and mm-hmm. and that takes you on this great adventure throughout music i don't have to be one one thing you know i don't have to be a guitarist i don't have to be a pianist i don't have to be a a jazz guy i don't you know i'll come out with a rock album cuz i have a lot of music in me and it comes out and i don't really have a any control over it it just does its own thing and and i just try to do the best in service of it you know so that's, that's beautiful deal. <laughs> that's beautiful um maybe uh, in 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 regards to knowing yourself more how do you deal with um self doubt oh self doubt i you know uh everybody has it i guess yeah but i i'm no exception i i play through it you know i i'm wise enough to know that there is something on the other side of mm. that and and the self doubt the only the only aim the only objective that self doubt has is to get you to stop <laughs> so I don't listen to it and I just mm-hmm. play through it. I play through it. And some of my best songs have started off with me playing something and me thinking to myself that's complete and utter bullshit. You know, like that's which that's one terrible. Do you have the one in in uh, in mind? There's many. <laughs> 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 uh th- not nothing particular comes to mind okay. um but many have started with me going like um you know oh that's so terrible that's awful And just just having a lot of self doubt, you know, while while proceeding through the the invention of some something or not, you know, and but just kind of letting it exist, you know, letting it be there because you know if you don't if you don't take a risk, then you're not gonna find anything new. Mm. So, and and to take that leap of faith, you know. It's uh, so I guess faith is the antidote to doubt, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And um, I have faith that there's something better or something worthwhile on the other side of that doubt, you know. Yeah. So I'll just go. I'll just go through it, you know. Allow myself to to have the doubt, recognize it, but just keep playing because you know you can do it you know that's great i mean that's something that i guess comes with experience but i'm sure or yeah. i'm curious was there times earlier in your development where you had a different view on it well sometimes i got to a critical point where i was absolutely crippled by self doubt and and there i mean sometimes you have to make some changes into your in your environment you know Sometimes it's like if you're if you're all up in your head and you're all you're all out of whack and and you can't play anything with without tripping then maybe you need to uh maybe you need to clean your room you know maybe there's all these things that are connected you know that you know that's one of the wisest things you know my dad ever taught me and he's taught me a lot of them but one thing is like you know if you're feeling bad you know just clean your room clean your clean your space you know mm. and uh that might be the thing that's that's bugging you you and sometimes when we when we're feeling something inside we tend to ascribe it to internal uh causes you know but maybe it's just something as simple as that get organized the yeah the outside stuff you know maybe it's uh like you know that i had one time i realized uh 
New York was getting to me, you know, so I I left. I went to to Barcelona and lived in Barcelona for six months, and and that cured me, you know. And、mm. one time I felt like I was I had a crisis because I felt like I I knew. I knew too much. My brain was too active while I was playing. It was always just yelling out everything I was doing: C major, C C sharp, <laughs> minor. You know, <laughs>、yeah. and I couldn't, I couldn't get it to shut up. You know, and、mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't listen to the music because my brain was going. My intelligence was just, you know, totally beyond its,、uh, beyond its its place. It's it's、mm -hmm. it's ready. It's it's. Rightful place, you know. It's really so. I decided. Well, you know what? I can flip these keys and、uh, I can sabotage my intellect, you know. And so I did that, and that's what ended up being the the, the foundation step,、right? of the next step. Yeah.、Mm. So sometimes you gotta like you gotta you gotta flip the script. Sometimes. Uh, when it gets too bad, you know. But normally, you know, little、uh, low levels of of doubt, you just just play through it, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> that's so cool. Sometimes I mean, the, you have the, to reorganize yourself. The the process of detuning the guitars has been in the part of the guitar canon for you know for, forever. But、uh, yeah. I, I I from my perspective, I always see it as something very radical, you know, when. <laughs> The guitarist detunes his guitar, but I'm I'm sure I'm I'm curious about the、um, the process of of doing that with the next step, and then how was it then for you to get back to original uh, uh, tuning, finding how did you refine the same the,、yeah. those colors then? Yeah, it was a really fascinating process because in the beginning, I didn't want to、uh, in the beginning. I wanted to know as much as I could about the guitar, so I was really studying, and that got to be、uh, out of balance with my intellect. And then I sabotaged my intellect so that I wouldn't be able to know anything,、yeah. and I could get just get back in touch with the primordial feeling of of playing an instrument and just creating sound and enjoying that, and not knowing, you know, my brain going C major seven, C major seven. You know, now I'm playing a chord, I'm just hearing these notes, and and my brain is not telling me anything because it's got nothing. You know, it doesn't know. It's、mm -hmm. just my ears that could maybe figure it out. But I would, I just was,、uh, just、um, reveling in in the feeling of. Of not knowing what、uh, labels are ascribed to things when I'm playing them and just hearing the sounds, then all these songs came out of that, which I then I used a tuner to tell me what note I was playing. Wow! And, and then figuring out what the chords were, and then wrote the songs down on on paper, and then I brought them into the band with Mark Turner and Ben Street and Jeff Ballard. And started playing those songs, and and then I discovered that I didn't know anything, <laughs> so I couldn't play. All I could do was play the melody, because I, you know, the whole guitar was a mystery. So then I started shedding and learning the alternate tuning guitar. Yeah, figuring out if I want to play in a major seven here, I'll just play it. I'll play the shape as if it were a minor major seven, and then when I go down here, I'll I'll play the shape as if it's a Lydian, and I'll if I go up here, I'll play it as if it's a Mixolydian scale,、wow. and just com combining all of these different things that I knew from from shapes I had learned on the regular guitar, putting them as patchwork, so that I could play through the harmony of. One chord, like so, one chord on the altered guitar might be me thinking of five different changes depending on which area of the neck I was, and then, <laughs> and then got to the point where we were playing, and then we did the album, and then after that, I retuned the guitar, and I was so happy to actually know something、mm -hmm. that it had to totally cured me. So <laughs> nice. I came full circle with it. Yeah. Was there a need to ever go back to that tuning or another tuning like that? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, later on. I yeah, I wrote several other songs in in other tunings, and I I love doing it. I love the I love the freedom and the the sense of uh, a very fertile ground that you've not explored anymore. Mm. You know, it's like going to a new forest that that you don't know where the things are. You know, it's so playing the guitar, the regular guitar. Yeah, because Sorry. it's 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 only those twelve notes, but it's seeing it through a prism <laughs> or you know, yeah, each time. <laughs> Those dang 12 notes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Why 12? Eh, why 12? I, I guess there's as many as you want there to be. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's those, those yeah. 12 that most of us agree upon. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's it's unbelievable, right? It's it's mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. How's your, uh, in terms of um, uh, technique on the piano, it looks very effortless when you play, like uh, not a lot of uh, movement or effort even uh, in, in a good way. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, like how did you work on that or how, how, how is your approach to, to the physical approach to playing piano? Oh, how's it grounded? I don't, uh, I don't know. It's, um, Just something that's always uh, been there. little things that I that I know you know hmm. little tricks you know little things like you know on guitar I might feel a little bit uh, more self-conscious about doing things that are really easy <laughs> but on <laughs> piano <laughs> on piano I love like uh, <laughs> like that, for example, you know, <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't pr probably let myself do that on guitar. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But here's an A flat seven, flat nine, 13. And I just go mm. and just resolve it, you know? Yeah. I just have fun, you know, on the piano. I feel very free. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so physically, uh, I, j I just play a lot and um, I'm, I'm fine. I don't have many expectations about, about, uh, about my, that I should be on any particular level. I just enjoy playing. So that's how it sounds. I guess. Cool. It really That's sounds like you're having fun and like uh, you're just, yeah, there for the ride yeah. <laughs> through yeah. those uh, musical words that you've created <laughs> in those pieces. Yeah. Yeah. I read That's this, why I think uh, the, uh, sorry. Again. That's why I think the piano album is, is a, is a nice um, addition to my output because it, it, it has that side to it. You know that very kind of simple relationship between somebody and music. You know, whereas the guitar is more more developed and and more I don't know, sort of a rarefied thing in a way. Sometimes you know, mm. it's been highly uh, um, developed. You know, mm -hmm. but. Uh, And so it can be 
maybe existing in a realm that is uh, uh, perhaps less accessible maybe to to a listener um may, i don't know maybe that's not true but i mean i'm always ex, ex, uh, expressing myself but but the particulars of what's going on in inside the music when i play guitar might be a little bit more uh i don't know um yeah developed i suppose yeah, whereas yeah, I the, know what whereas you mean. the pia- piano is just like this uh, this very basic very simple um <clears throat> uh easier relationship maybe you know mm. with with uh with the music you know mm-hmm. um, not, not to put down my guitar playing but <laughs> 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 um maybe we could talk about um as a last topic because i have to pick up my my kids uh, real soon yeah so i gotta go too so maybe uh let's get into your piano influences and um you can let me know who who are important guys for you but i've, I've read the names of bud powell and elmo hope a lot when you describe yeah. your music um mm-hmm. so i'm interested yeah. in your view on their music but also wh- whoever else is um, coming up yeah for sure uh elma hope bud powell <clears throat> monk are my guys on piano uh <clears throat> and um you know keith jarrett uh to a certain extent as well i mean he's a titan of uh, of the piano and and his melodic expression and soulfulness i i'm mm. inspired by on the piano and also uh like also some piano concertos like um like with rock Monanoff piano concerto number three mm. uh and uh other pieces of rock Monanoff i find and and very beautiful and chopin and debussy very much influence my piano stylings Mm -hmm. and uh um and then like uh um errol garner Mm -hmm. is an influence on the piano uh my dad used to play a lot like errol garner Mm -hmm. Um, so i get it sort of through my dad this errol garner playing very rolling kind of way you know and some stride and rolling right hand and Mm. uh yeah also frank hewitt i was watching frank hewitt play a lot at smalls it's a perhaps not a widely known pianist but frank hewitt but frank hewitt was a uh one of the um the old guard at, at smalls you know he's a incredible bebop pianist and magical pianist and i would sit watching him uh uh playing very very many nights at smalls and learning a lot from him and uh also from from barry harris through a lot of the guys that i would listen to i didn't study directly with with barry but but i was influenced a lot by a lot of the cats that studied with barry so mm. a lot of the things that came from barry got to me through these other players you know and um like uh, sasha perry who's also very much influenced by bud and and monk and all and all those guys too but his particular approach to playing and also just seeing somebody play watching somebody play in that style is 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 different from listening to records because you're you're watching somebody make it happen live mm. obviously so so just watching sasha play was an influence on on me and uh i think he's he's a tremendous musician so yeah like like that you know 